You're the guy people call when they need a helping hand, moving furniture, unloading a truck. But lately, your shoulder's been acting up, and you're the one who's calling for help. And that's the moment you realize you can no longer shoulder the load. The Joint and Spine Center is Cincinnati's leading destination for orthopedic care with a range of surgical and non-surgical treatments. So when a moment has the power to change the rest of your life, go to the one place with the power to change it for the better, the Christ Hospital Health Network. This changes everything. The Pound This Podcast is brought to you by the Christ Hospital Health Network. This is the Pound This Podcast, and I am Amanda Valentine. Thank you so much for listening. This is an In Case You Missed It episode. So I had so many great interviews in 2020. I kind of wanted to start off 2021 with a replay of some of these interviews in case you missed it or in case you are new here, which, by the way, um, was actually pretty hard to narrow down to uh, five for, for the week. But this was definitely a highlight of 2020 for me is talking to Jordan Syatt. If you don't follow him on Instagram, you should because he's pretty freaking awesome. So this is episode 614, In Case You Missed It, Unfiltered Weight Loss Truth with Jordan Syatt. I want to lose weight, but I don't know how to get started. What should I meal prep every week? How do I get those sweet booty gains? Inspiration for your healthy lifestyle. The Pound This Podcast with Amanda Valentine. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the Pound This Podcast. I'm Amanda Valentine. I'm fangirling a little bit over my guest right now because I'm an Instagram stalker. I'm a creeper. I never engage, but I just lurk and, and I watch from, from, from miles away behind a screen. Is Jordan Syatt. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I am awesome. I'm so honored that you're on my podcast. So thank you so much for, for chatting with me. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I love that you just have such a, a you know, no BS <laughs> attitude towards towards weight loss. I know for me, my personal story is I've been obese for most of my life. I yo-yo dieted for a decade and then I've lost over 100 pounds and maintained for eight and a half years. But one of the reasons I started this podcast is just there's just so much crap information out there and you don't know who to trust, especially the deeper we get into the internet and the deeper you go on Instagram and things like that of everybody has their quick fix or their way to do it. And this is the right way. This is the wrong way. And I love that you just like clear cut it out of like, nah, this is, this is the truth. This is real. I think that's so helpful for people that struggle with their, their food and their fitness and just their own journey. Thank you. I appreciate that. And huge congratulations on all of your success. That's incredible. Thank you. So I wanted to know since you, I mean, I watched that. I don't want to say that, that you, you rant, <laughs> 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 but that, what are you think the top three things are like myths or trends that you see people do with weight loss that just kind of makes you want to scream and punch the screen? So there are a lot and it changes all the time like constantly just depending on what phase or what fad we're in. Um, right now, I would say, number one, eliminating any single macronutrient from your entire diet completely. So in this case, more recently, I would say the no carb route, like oftentimes ketogenic or carnivore, or whatever it is, uh, really gets under my skin big time. I hate it, mainly just because any of these fads, they're not sustainable long term. And that's the number one issue is like, if you're going to do something, do something that you can enjoy and sustain, right? So, I mean, I don't know a single person that really doesn't enjoy carbohydrates. Like, I think it's safe to say basically everybody likes carbs. Yeah. Um, so keto, I would say, I would say any type of um, like fasting or, or not fasting or uh, like cleansing, like juice cleansing or detoxes pisses me off. It's like, number one, just the science isn't there at all. I think it can actually do a lot more harm than good. For me, it's one of those things like when someone's like, oh, so you're saying that if someone has an issue with their liver, then you wouldn't encourage them to do a detox. I'm like, if someone has an issue with their liver, then I'm going to encourage them to see a fucking doctor. <laughs> like, like I'm not going to tell them to do a detox from GNC that costs an outrageous amount of money. It's like, you have a liver problem. Talk to your doctor, not some Instagram influencer selling a diarrhea tea. <laughs> uh, and then I would say on top of that, and actually I will say I'm totally fine with intermittent fasting. I'm not a huge fan of the extended fasting I've seen a lot recently of whether it's like a 48 hours, 72 hours, 
of fasting. I think for some people, it's fine. For many people, it can exacerbate a lot of disordered eating habits. Um, so I would say those three are probably three of the main ones. Well, how do you handle or how do you suggest somebody handling, like, let's just say that somebody's way on board one of those things. Like, it feels like specifically the no carb train, like there is no talking to those people when they're like, this works, you are wrong, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, can you even have a conversation or do you just have to like drop it and walk away? No, you know what? You can have a conversation. What I, I used to feel the same way. I used to be like, man, these people, they just won't listen. They won't anything. And I realized it was how I was approaching the discussion. Right. Because I've realized the goal of a debate is not to win. The goal of a debate is to find common ground. Right. So when you get into a debate with someone, I think most we usually tend to go to by the end of this, I'm going to convince them they're wrong. That is the complete ass backwards way of going about a debate. You have to go into it with the sole purpose and goal of finding what you do agree on. And when that's your new approach, the whole conversation flows much more easily. And we often find that we were also being equally dogmatic. So whenever I get into a conversation with any of these people, first I say, listen, I could be wrong. I've been wrong in the past. I'm open to being wrong in the future. For me, my goal is sustainability, doing something that you can enjoy and sustain for the rest of your life. For me, I know that I'm going to want to be able to have bagels and cream cheese. I'm going to be able to want to have pizza at my daughter's birthday party. And I'm also going to be able to want to sustain uh, and enjoy my lifestyle while eating the foods that I love and looking the way I want to look and feel the way I want to feel. I've been able to do that while eating carbs. And I know many hundreds and thousands of people have been able to do the same. I'm not saying that you're wrong, but I am saying that this might be another option. What do you think? From there, if they're very dogmatic and they say, well, no insulin this, no insulin that, I'll usually bring about examples like, for example, okay, so I'll ask, so for example, under your uh, knowledge, white rice would be bad for you, correct? They'd be like, terrible for you. Mm -hmm. like, okay, interesting. So why in that case do you think that people in Japan, for example, who eat white rice on a daily basis have such a healthy body weight and overall healthy lifestyle? And it usually gets them thinking. And they're like, well, and they'll, sometimes people will say, no, you're wrong. That's BS. That's nonsense. And other people will be like, honestly, I never thought about that. For the people who are like, no, you're wrong. That's BS. I'm like, listen, if you enjoy what you're doing, I support you 100%. Personally, I like eating carbohydrates. So I'm going to keep doing that. But whatever works best for you. And I think the more I've done that, the more people have started to be like, you know, maybe, maybe I could have this, maybe I could have that. But the more I try and say, you're wrong, you're stupid, whatever it is, the, the deeper they dig their heels in. Yeah. Well, I see that as a topic that you bring up a lot on, on your Instagram specifically. And I see other people bringing it up too, is that, you know, the fact of being in a caloric deficit in order to lose weight. And it feels like you're, are you getting a lot of pushback on that, that people are fighting you? Like that's not the answer. You know, it's so interesting on Instagram, not much anymore. I feel like on Instagram, I have, you know, have my, my, my audience, my people, we tend to like agree on this nutrition side of things on the strength training side of things. Earlier on when I was building my audience, uh, I got in a lot more heated debates. Um, and it could also be that I'm sort of just done with it now. Like I'm, I'm done with debating. I'm like, all right, listen, if you don't believe me, fine, that's okay. Uh, so I don't really get into many debates on Instagram. On TikTok recently, though, and I've been building my TikTok, oh, it is, it's crazy. It's going back to like 2011 when I first started making content. I'm getting people telling me fruit is bad for you because fruit makes you fat. I'm getting people saying that they're they're gaining weight because they're they're not eating enough. I'm like everything, literally everything, uh, every myth is really prevalent on TikTok. And I think it's because it's a relatively new pl platform. There's a lot of misinformation on it. It's also a younger, less informed crowd. So uh, I get a lot of that on there. Well, I mean, speaking of, I didn't even know you were on TikTok. I mean, I watch you on Instagram and YouTube that you do so many things and you're so successful with all this stuff. I kind of back the train up here of, you know, just tell me how you got your start in health and fitness and how you built up to be where you are now. So that might be like a, a two week long story. So I'll try <laughs> and make it brief. Um, so I got into fitness from wrestling. I started wrestling when I was very young, when I was eight years old. Uh, and I loved it. I was obsessed with it. Uh, 
I made varsity as a freshman in high school. I beat a junior out for the varsity spot, but I had to cut a lot of weight. So I was cutting from 112 pounds to 103 pounds every week, sometimes multiple times a week. And I was good from a technique perspective. I was good from an endurance perspective, but I was 14 years old going up against mostly 17 and 18 year olds. And I didn't have the strength to really compete at a high level with them. So I wanted to learn how to build strength well also losing the weight that i needed to lose so i applied to a, a gym near me i was like hey you know I'll, I'll take the trash out i'll clean the floors let me just intern for you and learn from you and fortunately they took me under their wing and uh even more fortunately they were very science-based and and from a four, 14 years old i started coaching and interning and started learning a very science-based ap approach to strengthening strength and conditioning and nutrition became obsessed with it my first client ever was a 68 year old guy named Fred. He just wanted to be able to pick up his grandson without hurting his shoulder. Uh, and I fell in love with coaching. And, uh, and then from there, um, I started my website when I was 21. I was competitively powerlifting at the time. And I didn't know an online business was possible. I was just like, I'm going to write articles to help people and just write about my training, my nutrition. And I was in my college dorm room. And uh, people would reach out and ask me to write their programs and I would do it for free uh, just because, again, I didn't, I didn't know PayPal.com existed. I didn't know a business was possible. This is in July of 2011, so nine years ago. Um, and eventually, I remember one day a woman from Brazil who read my articles was like, how much do you charge for online coaching? And I was like, I don't know, $300. Yeah. And she was like, cool, how do I pay you? And I was like, uh, and I had to find PayPal and I made an account and so in college, I started this business just writing my articles one, one a week, every single week from 2011 to 2015, at least one, uh, and then started making Facebook posts and YouTube videos, mainly just like, again, I didn't know a business was possible. It was just to teach people what I had been taught. And then by the time I graduated college, I had a, an online business that was, it wasn't crazy, but it was, it was enough. And I just kept building and kept building. And then I moved to Israel for a while and I was living in Israel for several years. And then Gary Vaynerchuk's team reached out to me and they were like, do you want to coach Gary? So I moved from Tel Aviv to New York uh, about four years ago now and coached Gary seven days a week for three years straight. And, uh, and now it's been a year or so since I've coached Gary and I just do my online stuff. So how much has your life changed now with just being, you know, having such a, an online coaching presence versus coaching people in person? So a lot, um, I would say, so I coached people in person from 14 years old until 25 years old. So for over a decade, I was coaching people in person and I started coaching people online when I was 21, but still the majority of what I did was in person. I started the powerlifting team at my university, university of Delaware, and I coached two sessions a day, four days a week with like about 15 to 20 powerlifters. Then I would coach other people on the side in person. When I graduated college, I moved back to Boston where I was born and I worked at several gyms coaching in person and doing online. Um, and I love coaching in person. Like I really like it a lot. Um, there's nothing can really replace the one-on-one -on -one aspect of coaching someone in person from the beginning to the end, from meeting them the first time they walk into the gym, getting their movement patterns right, understanding that there's more like the psychological and behavioral side of it. So I love coaching people in person. The main issue as a coach and a business owner is it's a lot of time and a lot of energy. And also not everyone can afford one-on-one -on -one in-person coaching. It's just, it's a very, it's a luxury expense. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't like that. I want people to be able to afford what I offer. So uh, then when I transitioned more to fully online, it became more affordable for people and I could work with more people and help more people. Um, and personally for me, now I have more time to do other things as well, as opposed to only being on the floor for eight, 10, 12 hours a day. Time to do all those TikTok videos. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> and podcasts like this. Exactly. Yeah. So from having so many clients now, what would you say is like the common theme when they come to you? Like what's their, their biggest struggle that they're all dealing with? They don't believe they can succeed. Mm, yeah. They, they don't actually believe that it's possible. Whether they don't believe in their own ability to be consistent because they know like they've yo-yoed before. They don't believe in their own ability to actually uh, do what is needed or they don't believe that their body is capable of doing it. They don't believe like, hey, like maybe it's their age, their gender. Maybe it's things that were put on them when they were a kid by their parents. Maybe they just don't believe that they're capable of doing it physiologically, mentally, emotionally, 
or that like they just literally they want to do it, but they don't know if they're actually willing to do it. Uh, and I think that's the biggest struggle most people have. So what's the the process look like to get somebody to do such a, a major mindset shift when they've been telling themselves that they suck their whole life? That's a tough one. Yeah. It's, and, and I will not say this is the the only answer. There, it's a very multifaceted answer. And I think uh, it, there there's a lot of psychology and behavioral research that we could discuss. But for me, the best way that I've found, and I'll, I'll say this doesn't work for everybody. Like any coach who tells you all of 100% of their clients have succeeded is lying. That is not true. Every coach, I think the hardest thing to learn as a coach is to understand that you're not going to be able to help everybody. It's just, it's a very unfortunate truth. Um, but the vast majority of people I've been able to help, one of the best things I've been able to do is show them that they can't fuck this up, right? It's, it's one of the most important things to internalize. And to the point where I created a, a video course for all of my nutrition coaching clients early on in 2012. Uh, and the first video in the course was titled, you can't fuck this up. And I would send it to, it'd be the first video before they got their nutrition guidelines, before they got their training programs, before they got anything. The first video they saw was you can't fuck this up. And the responses were funny. People would be like, oh no, like I could definitely fuck this up. <laughs> you haven't seen me eat. And, the, and it, that was the joke. And I'd be like, watch the video first. And uh, basically the video is saying, is like, I don't care if you eat 5,000 calories more than you should. I don't care if you miss a workout or a week or a month of workouts. I don't care if, uh, if you binge for a weekend or a week or a month or a year. I don't care what happens. The only way you fail is if you quit altogether. And you cannot fuck this up as long as you get right back on track, period, end of story. And it obviously went in more detail than that, but it was eliminating this idea of failure. Mm -hmm. It was eliminating that possibility. Because when you take away that, that possibility and also when you take away that excuse, now they have no reason not to try and continue. Because what a lot of people will do is, We'll use an example, Friday night, they go out, have a bunch of drinks and pizza and, and ice cream and desserts, whatever. They eat a lot. They feel like they went way off track. They feel like they screwed up. They feel like they failed. They fucked up. And they're like, you know what? Well, whatever. I'll just get back on track on Monday. So they eat all weekend. They they binge and they eat too much. They don't work out. They feel awful. Then they've gained seven pounds, obviously not all of fat, but they go on the scale on Monday morning. They're like, oh my God, I've gained so much weight. What's the point? I can't believe I lost all my progress. I'm just, I'm giving up altogether. And they use that failure as a justification to quit. And my goal was to remove that justification. If I say, I don't care if you do that, as long as you get back on track, now they have an incentive to get back on track. They'll lose those seven pounds in one to two days real quick because it's mostly water, glycogen, stomach content. They'll see they didn't actually screw it up. And then through consistency, start to make more progress. Now we get into that loop of actually making the progress they thought they couldn't make. Yeah, I will say for me personally, I, I have lived in that cycle a lot <laughs> on my own journey. And having someone to point that out to you is huge. I wish somebody would have just, you know, just smacked me with some facts at the time and been like, <laughs> or at the time, I'm just like, ah, I'm trash. I can't do anything right. And then you just go eat, you know, an entire ice cream cake and cry and just live that <laughs> way. But it's like, it's just so important to just, again, the importance of having a coach or at least a positive person in your life to be like, it's fine of just how much that can change where out of this mindset of pass fail, uh, it feels like, I don't know why that is so prevalent with most of us of it's either like you're, you're completely on plan or you're completely off. There can't be some happy medium. And it feels like all of us struggle to some degree until we kind of figure it out for ourselves of trying to like live in the gray area of, I don't know why that is so freaking difficult. I don't know if you have an answer for that. <laughs> You know, I th it's very normal. I think it would be, it would be, I would say to not live in the gray area or to live in the gray area, I think is a very advanced mindset that like if we're looking at, and this is across all aspects of life, it's much easier. The more uneducated you are in anything, the more easily you're swayed to one or the other carbs are bad is an uneducated opinion that you get from having a very emotional response that you're like, well, carbs are bad. Same thing with politics. I'm either far right or far left. It's like, where's the middle ground here? Yeah, right. Same thing with everything in life. The, the people who are the least educated often are the most dogmatic in thinking their way is the only way. So when you have something like weight loss, for example, in which more people unfortunately struggle with it than don't, 
and most of those people don't actually believe they can succeed and they're being fed misinformation from every corner of the internet and their family and friends and everything it's like they they aren't coming from an advanced mindset they're coming from a very emotional uh lack of knowledge mindset so it's like how can they be in the gray area when they don't even know that area exists and that's sort of my job or our job as fitness professionals is to show them hey here's this this exists and and the only way for you to find it is through trial and error that's the part that really sucks is right it's like Mm -hmm. we can't just take their hand and lead them there we sort of have to like sort of push them and say all right like go try it. I'm going to be here. I'm going to make sure you don't fall off either end. I'm going to make sure like you stay balanced and you keep going. I'm going to hear, here to motivate you, but you've got to try and you've got to, that's why I'll never tell someone not to do keto. Number one, because if I say don't do keto, the first thing they're going to do is keto. Yeah. And second is like, if I, when they, through trying it, at least they'll learn, they'll learn what foods are high in protein. They'll learn that probably it's more sustainable to be able to eat carbs in moderation rather than eliminating them all together. And then rather than me just saying, hey, well, they go do keto and I just leave, I stay with them throughout the process. They voice their concerns. They voice their wins. They voice their failures. We have a conversation about it. And through those conversations and discussions, then they decide, you know what, maybe I'll add a little bit more carbs in then. Cool. Now they're no longer doing keto. Now they can do it more sustainably. And now they've found the gray area. Well, like all of that is just so hard to do in a normal life. So what happens for you as a coach when you throw in a global pandemic and people like, you know, I, I've gotten so much feedback, including myself of like wanting in to go into old patterns after you think that you've got into that gray area. And then, Oh, here comes the binge eating. Here comes the emotional eating because I don't know how to deal with this insane world around us. And all of this progress that you think that you have made prior to March. Now it just feels like it's skidded all over the road of how do you, coach somebody to deal with all this we're all learning right now (laughs) this is uh i i do not have global pandemic experience that's for sure right Um, but what i have learned is i'm definitely in that gray area in terms of as a coach i know right now for some people in a in a very odd way for some people this is their ideal time to focus on their nutrition i have clients who are uh high level, uh, businessmen and women, CEOs, CFOs, uh, they traveling constantly for work. Now they're home. They're not traveling. They're at home. They, they're not going out to business, to business dinners and meetings. It's like, great. I can actually focus on my nutrition now for the first time. Mm -hmm. And for them, it's wonderful. On the other end of the spectrum, I know for other people, this is the worst possible scenario ever for their nutrition, being stuck at home in their kitchen, in their pantry, constantly surrounded by food, more stressed because their kids are at home. They're not at school. They've got to homeschool their kids. They might be struggling with work and and income. Now, also in terms of they can't get out of the house, the only source of thing that they have control over is what they're eating. And maybe they're literally just going to go off the wall and binge. And it's like for them, I would say now is probably the worst possible time to be focusing on fat loss. I'll be focusing on something else, whether for, for example, for someone who's struggling right now with food and maybe they want to binge, maybe they're having doing a lot of emotional eating, I would say the worst thing you could do right now is focus on fat loss and, and body composition. I wouldn't recommend counting calories at all. I would say make a goal that is completely and utterly performance focused. And I think this carries over to many aspects of life, but I would say let's focus on improving your mile time. Let's focus on improving your push-ups. Let's focus on improving something that you can actually track and monitor to improve in terms of your physical performance. When they see their mile time improving, when they see they're getting more steps in every day, when they see they're getting their first push-up, first five push-ups, first 10 push-ups, they see this improvement. Now all of a sudden they have some, they have a reason to actually improve their nutrition and they don't actually have to focus on it so so uh, meticulously they can say well what's going to be the better food for fueling my progress for fueling my my performance for making me feel better and they can start to do that more intuitively as opposed to necessarily being like okay well i need to be in a calorie deficit so i'm going to track all my calories be meticulous and then binge every night yeah so speaking of progress goals for you personally what do you feel like are some of your biggest progress goals that you have hit Uh, so for right now, I think the biggest thing is I'm training jujitsu six times a week, which has just been 
amazing for my health and sanity. Um, I, I don't have like access to barbells and, and all that stuff right now. Um, but I've been doing jujitsu, uh, just with one guy, we've been rolling six, di- six days a week. And my goal for 2020 before everything happened was to get my blue belt in jujitsu, which, uh, usually takes about two years at this point. I've been doing jujitsu for a year. And so I wanted to get my blue belt. I don't know if that's going to happen by the end of this year at this point. Um, but, uh, jujitsu for me is my, like, that's my release, my mental, emotional. It's like where I can basically meditate. Um, it's my hour of the day where it, not only do I not want to look at my phone, I physically cannot look at my phone. I'm trying to prevent someone from choking me out. Mm-hmm. So um, for me, a lot of my focus on that, and as a result of trying to get better at jujitsu, I have to improve my flexibility and mobility. So doing things to improve uh, my hip mobility, my splits, uh, my pigeon stretch, all of that stuff, uh, and also my cardio. So I'm doing a fair amount of sprints on a weekly basis and stuff like that. So uh, that's really where my performance efforts are. Yeah, I just think that's such an important point of just to find something that brings you like joy and that you can be happy with. And I feel like that's what through this pandemic, like so many people had that happy spot in the gym and now it's taken away and you just kind of feel like lost in the dark of like, how do I find this thing Um, where instead of having that mindset of this sucks, I can't go to the gym. Let's I'm just I'm just going to give it up of like it feels like there's so many good like online it's just fitness or anything sort of groups or classes or free things on YouTube that you can take part of to kind of find your new thing and see it as an opportunity instead of something being taken away from you. And I don't know if you've seen that helping people or not of, through this, of finding kind of new avenues of things that brought them joy that they never would have anticipated. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think what this has been able to do, at least from my perspective as a coach, is get people to really relentlessly focus on the basics, right? It's like you go to the gym, there's all this equipment, all these different exercises, you got battle ropes, you've got these machines, you got all this stuff. And it, it's like, oh, cool, I want to try it all. Now you're at home. And maybe you have literally zero equipment. So, I mean, one of the things that I did, I made is like a 30-day bodyweight workout challenge. And every workout has a new challenge within the workout. So there's a new challenge you can accomplish within it, whether it's beating your time, beating your number of reps, whatever it is. And I think having some type of competition, even and especially with yourself, is super, super important. I know some people are more or less competitive or more and less competitive. Some, some people are very competitive and like everything in their life is – a huge competition and other people are not, but I think competition is very healthy. And the more you can get yourself to try and be better than you were the day before and to try and compete against yourself. And the more you can find anchor points to try and improve, whether it's your steps, your, how, how long you're being active throughout the day, maybe it's trying to improve your screen time. So you spend less time on your screen, spending less time on your screen, on your screen. You're probably doing more things that are probably better for you. Um, there are a number of ways you can work to improve, but, uh, I think throughout this pandemic, the fitness industry has been very creative in ways to get people up and moving and, and improving. So if somebody is is listening to this and they're kind of struggling right now with food and fitness or just, you know, all of the above or they're on, in a plateau and they're freaking out and they're ready to give up, like what would be your best advice to that person right now? So let's talk to the person who who's in a quote unquote plateau, right? Okay. The person like... Uh, I'm just not making any progress. It's just nothing is working. Uh, There's a lot we could say to that. Number one, I would say is let's look at the most important part of that discussion. What are your options? Right? The options are A, quit. B, keep going. Mm -hmm. It's like, for me, it's a very (laughs) simple answer. Cool. So you're not making as, as much progress as you want, at least from the the metrics you're looking at, right? Maybe you're looking at your scale and your weight. Maybe you're looking at your measurements. Uh, maybe you're just looking at your yourself in the mirror every day in which you're probably being too hard on yourself regardless. But either way, in your mind, you're not improving quickly enough, which from my experience, most people are com- being completely and utterly assholes to themselves and they're not actually doing it from a realistic perspective. But either way, you've got two options. You keep going because you know it's the right thing to do or you quit. So with those two options, my, my answer is always keep going because at worst comes to worst, at least you're improving your health. Yeah. Like someone, someone asked me on my Instagram Q and A the other day, they said, is working out three times a week really better than doing nothing at all? And I was just like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> like what, what, what would ever, ever prompt you to ask such a question? Of course, something is always better than nothing. Yeah. Always. Always. 
So if the answer, if the question is, well, I'm, I'm in a plateau, do I just quit or do I keep going? I would rather you at least keep going, stay in a plateau for your whole life because at least the cellular benefits, the health benefits, the mental, the emotional, the hormonal benefits of exercising is better than not exercising. I think we can all agree on that. Well, what do you so, say to the person that's on a plateau that doesn't, d- does not the quitting, but then decides to like ramp it to some insane level of like, well, I'm going to back the calories down to 800, 800 a day. And then I'm going to do two hours of cardio to get out of this plateau. I would say that's really fucking stupid. <laughs> <laughs> like that's just, for me, the question I would always ask them, I was like, okay, cool. So that's what you say you're going to do. Let's, I would always ask them, what's the name of their best friend? And they tell me, I don't know, Janice. Cool. Let's say Janice says to you, uh, listen, my weight hasn't gone down in a week. I'm going to drop my calories to 800 and I'm going to increase my cardio to two hours a day. What do you tell Janice? They probably would tell their best friend Janice. It's a really fucking stupid <laughs> idea. They, cool. Take that advice. Yeah. It's like you would never tell your best friend to do that. Why in the hell are you doing that? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and usually that hits home with them. Not to mention the reality is I, I hate the word plateau. I absolutely with every ounce of my being, hate the word plateau because it assumes that you're not making progress. And anytime someone says I'm in a plateau, I'm like, well, what do you mean you're in a plateau? They're like, well, I've only lost four pounds in the last, uh, in the last like eight weeks. Right. So I've only lost four pounds in two months. What's the, what's the issue with that? Yeah. Well, it's, it's not fast enough. What do you mean? It's not fast enough. Well, Janice lost eight pounds. It's like, why the fuck are you paying attention to Janice? <laughs> Yeah. Why does what Janice do affect you? Like, well, I should be losing weight faster. Why? Why should you be losing weight faster? Because I should. That's a stupid fucking answer. It's like, <laughs> why? You have to ask these questions. And the reality is people say they're in a plateau when the reality is they're just in the process. If you lost one pound a week every week for the next year, you'd have lost 52 pounds. Not every not everybody has 52 pounds to lose. And even if you do, that's a fuck ton of weight to lose very, very, very quickly. In two years, it's 104 pounds. Yeah. That's a lot of weight to lose. What's the rush? Mm-hmm. Stop complaining. Keep going. You're not in a plateau. You're in the process. This is how it works. And yet I know I know it's hard because a lot of people on Instagram are putting up these insane transformation stories of look how much progress I made in 24 days. By the way, buy my program. It's 20% off. Da, 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 da. It's like you have to use your logical understanding of marketing and nonsense. No, that's bullshit. And even if they did make that progress, it doesn't matter because they're not you. So yeah. focus on what you're doing. Yeah. And then you also have to take into account angles and photography. <laughs> yeah, of course. Angles, lighting, the clothing they're wearing, and not to mention, oh, anabolic steroids and drugs and Photoshop. It's like, it's yeah. very, very important to understand this. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. So if uh, le- the off the plateau topic, if somebody is just looking to get healthier or lose weight, what would you say is the most focused, their most important thing to focus on from here on out? I would say make sure you're you're keeping track of your nutrition And that's a pretty general answer, right? It's like keeping track of your nutrition. What does that mean? For some people, I would say, listen, if you really want to lose weight, you have to be in a calorie deficit. But I don't think that's necessarily what most people need to focus on at first. It was funny. I was talking with someone the other day. I'm trying to remember who I was talking to. Remember who I was talking to, Rico, who said the thing about I never skip. Oh, I was on a podcast with a wonderful woman. She's lost a lot of weight. She said the thing that helped her lose weight the most was she completely stopped snacking and she stopped skipping meals. Mm. This was one of my favorite things I've ever heard anyone say. And this is why I love talking to people who've been successful with weight loss because I always learn something from, from other people just from what they've done. When you think about this advice, it's genius because what happens? A lot of people when they're snacking, they're mindlessly eating. They're, they have no idea how much they're eating. And then what happens when they snack too much, then they feel guilty about it. So they skip a meal. Yeah. Then what happens when they skip the meal, they get hungry, they start snacking again, they end up eating way more than they thought. So she stopped snacking completely and made sure to enjoy her meals fully sit down for her meals, enjoy them, put a big plate in front of her, ate the full meal, never skipped a meal and never snacked. Now I'm not saying snacking is bad and you can never do it. But this is one very simple way to probably put yourself in a calorie deficit without actually having to track your calories and also develop a very healthy relationship with food. We brought up an, another wonderful topic in here 
a lot of people, they don't actually enjoy their food. They're eating standing up. They're on the go. They're just putting it in their mouth. They're not taking a moment to think about where did this food come from? How did this food get on my plate? Let me sit down and really enjoy and cherish this food that I have in front of me. And I'm not going to just uh, snack and stand up and go, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to snack. I'm going to wait until I can sit down, enjoy this big, wonderful meal in front of me, and then I'm not going to eat until my next meal. So I'd say have three to four meals a day. Don't snack in between. Don't skip a meal. I think that's a wonderful place to begin. Oh, that's awesome. See, I am the opposite, though. Uh, snacking helped me more because I have such this like binge tendency. I just want to eat. I want the mm -hmm. hand motion thing. Like I eat with baby spoons. <laughs> okay. And that's a mind trick that I use because it makes it feel like more food. Like mm. I really enjoy the feeling of just eating more. So then it's planned out for me so I can snack throughout the day. I do have like meals too, but not huge meals just so I can have that feeling that I feel like I'm eating more and that's helped me. So it's crazy how just you take two completely different people. That's why it's so hard to just take somebody's success story off the internet as gospel because the two totally different methods worked for two totally different people. And what works for you could be completely different than what worked for these two people. And to think that you're this terrible failure and you can never figure this out because that method didn't work for you is just insane. I love that. That makes me super happy that you said that because the reality is the only way you're going to lose fat is by being in a calorie deficit, right? So find what works best for you. If snacking helps you, I'm all for it. Amazing. If snacking encourages you to end up binging, then don't do it. But the only way you would have figured this out is through trying on your own. Mm -hmm. And now you know, now you know for you, snacking is, is a really good option, having these smaller bites throughout the day. For someone else, it might also work. For someone else, it might not work. But this is where we can find that gray area because we have that educated back knowledge and we know, listen, I don't care what you do as long as you enjoy it as long as you can sustain it and as long as it gives you progress. If you enjoy it and can sustain it and it gives you progress, I support you 100%. 100, yeah. I 1,000% agree. That's awesome. So if somebody is like interested in joining your inner circle, is this the kind of like conversations you're having there? Is this the kind of content that you can expect? Yeah. So what I'll say is this. Um, my inner circle is uh, my monthly membership for fitness, training, nutrition, all this stuff, but do not buy it if this is the first time you're hearing me. Okay. Uh, I would rather you go to my free content, go to my Instagram, go to my YouTube, go to my podcast, hear more of what I have to say. If you like what I have to say, by all means, you're welcome to join the inner circle. Uh, I never want people to think I'm just coming straight out of the box to be like, yeah, join my program. It's, it's, it's 24, 99 a month. It's not very much. It's very accessible to people all over the world. Uh, but I'd rather you get as much as you can from me for free before you decide to join that. That's awesome. Well, I, I'm so excited that you joined me on my podcast and I, I, I will continue to stalk you online <laughs> and consume all of your free content. I'm going to go add you on TikTok now. <laughs> um, Jordan Syed, thank you so, so much. Of course, this was a pleasure. Thank you. For info on health coaching and more, go to amandavalentinebites.com.